This is The Wealth of the Past. Dr. Amelia R. Brown is Senior Lecturer in Greek History and Language in the Classics and Ancient History Discipline of the School of Historical and Philosophical Inquiry at the University of Queensland, Australia. She currently holds a Discovery Early Career Research Award from the Australian Research Council to research the impact of sailors and travellers on the development of ancient Greek religion and identity. Before coming to UQ in 2010, she was a Hannah Seeger Davis Fellow in Hellenic Studies at Princeton University. In 2008, she received her PhD in Ancient History and Mediterranean Archaeology from the University of California at Berkeley, with a dissertation on the history of Corinth in late antiquity. Her current research focuses on late antiquity, Greek religion, and Mediterranean maritime history, particularly in Roman Corinth, Thessaloniki, and Malta. She has excavated Halasana on the island of Kos, Polis in Cyprus, ancient Messene in Corinth, and is currently completing books on Corinthian history and Mediterranean maritime religion. Please enjoy my interview with Dr. Amelia R. Brown. Let's just jump right into it. Um, I just, I'd love to know about your story and when you really got into history and when you knew you wanted to become a history professor. Yes, well, I've always been interested in old things in particular. Uh, um, when I was a kid growing up in Vermont, I used to dig in the backyard and uh, find uh, old pottery and glass and wash it off and put it in a special trunk. Uh, but it wasn't actually um, probably until my Latin teacher in seventh grade, uh, year seven, you know, in Australia, um, that I really started to think about the ancient world, the ancient Mediterranean world as the, the area that I wanted to study the history of and the archaeology of in, in great detail. And she, um, uh, Ms. Bloomberg, was a really passionate uh, advocate, not just of the Latin language, but also of Greek uh, and of literature and history and archaeology and learning about all of those things. Uh, and over the course of uh, six years, from year seven until year 12, uh, I got to have her uh, as a, a really influential teacher and mm. mentor. So she um, also guided me towards uh, particularly looking at Princeton as a, a place to go to university uh, and, uh, uh, and to the Hellenic Studies program there, uh, where, uh, where I enjoyed um, doing my undergraduate. So uh, while I was a, an undergraduate student, I began to shift uh, away from Latin and towards Greek language and also away from Roman history, uh, narrowly defined to a kind of more broad based view of classical history that includes both Greeks and Romans, and especially the Greeks uh, during the Roman imperial era. Mm. So uh, uh, in graduate school then at Berkeley, I began to specialize uh, more narrowly, although I still have pretty broad interests compared to a lot of classicists. Uh, I began to specialize in late antiquity uh, and in looking at Greek culture under the Roman Empire from the second century, the kind of height of the, the Roman Empire through to the, the Middle Ages uh, and the rise of the Byzantine Empire um, and the, the really takeover of the Roman Empire by Greek-speaking um, uh, Greek speaking, uh, emperors and officials, um, but also by the church um, as, uh, as the church came to be the only tolerated form of religion in the Roman Empire. That's absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I guess you have to start somewhere and it's yeah. amazing how you know, one teacher can really just captivate you and yeah, just yeah, be so motivational yeah. and inspiring and yeah, she, can she lead you in that direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. She was great. And she's still teaching at my uh, alma mater, Dana Hall School in Wellesley, Massachusetts. So uh, I, uh, I thank her very much for everything uh, she did. Um, mm -hmm. to, uh, to help me on this path. But I, I still have uh, some things that I collected uh, as a kid, uh, as a little kid, um, and uh, I was interested in, in uh, evidence from the past of all kinds, uh, mm -hmm. and the recent past as well as the more remote past. I mm -hmm. wrote a little booklet about King Tut's tomb when I was in about uh, year cool. two. Yeah. Uh, and I also 
collected more recent stuff, especially uh, uh, Victorian and kind of early 20th century Art Nouveau and Art Deco, um, you know, art and uh, um, paintings and sculpture and even objet d'art and anything that I could kind of get my hands on from mm. that that era, which uh, I find really fascinating too. And I feel like um, you know, one of the things I love about the ancient world is that uh, there is such a variety of evidence that is available to us today uh, of, uh, of art, uh, of architecture, of literature, um, but uh, you know, also just uh, you know, insights into their thoughts and feelings and ideas about the world, some of which are very similar to ours and some of which are very different. And it just gives you, you know, an, an insight into the many different ways that people have had uh, of, uh, of living in the world and of living in cities and of relating mm -hmm. to one another and of thinking about them um, themselves and of thinking about the world and of creating art and architecture, all of mm -hmm. those things you mm -hmm. can uh, find out in, in greater depth and complexity um, because of the unique, um, you know, status of the, uh, the record from the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. uh, from the ancient Mediterranean world. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just so fascinating, just mm -hmm. the relevant mm -hmm. that, you know, those societies and cultures have had. Yeah. Um, and the fact that there is, you know, a link in all these stories, you know, mm -hmm. the Romans were influenced by the Greeks and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, Corinth was... That was a bit of a you know a mix of um, yes, you know, it was a Greek real culture, mix. right, and mm -hmm, Roman mm -hmm. culture and Christianity. And Egyptians and too. Uh, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, worth noting. It's very important to note that the uh, the Greeks also um, credited the Egyptians with being a much older civilization and with uh, having taught them about sculpture and architecture as well as philosophy and religion, uh, making statues even, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the Greeks were also indebted um, to other. Uh, Near Eastern cultures, especially the the people we call the Phoenicians, the ancient mm -hmm. Lebanese, and uh, uh, and the Jews, uh, and a uh, um, multitude of smaller and larger kingdoms that used to be in uh, in Asia Minor um, and further inland in Syria. Um, that uh, these uh, kingdoms uh, each had different cult customs and traditions, um, but they all were eventually united uh, mm -hmm. first. <clears throat> in the Assyrian Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a great show on right now at the British Museum, actually on Ashurbanipal, okay. one of the, uh, the great kings, conquering kings of the Assyrian Empire, and then later on in the Persian Empire, um, uh, which uh, is a bit more famous, um, the one set up by Cyrus and, uh, mm -hmm. and then really expanded, expanded uh, by Darius, mm -hmm. his uh, successor. Um, so that uh, the, the Greeks were um, really thoroughly um, uh, influenced, but also uh, engaged with mm -hmm. uh, uh, ancient Mediterranean civilization that then reached quite far inland to mm -hmm. the east, uh, as mm -hmm. far as, as India, um, eventually. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's um, so incredible just trying to imagine what their worldview would look mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just to, to be a Greek, for instance, you know, and to even you know, consider them, you know, traveling to a place like Egypt. Yes, you know, yeah, and, you yeah. Know, these yeah, distant lands, yeah, and for them it yeah. just must have been such a mm -hmm. extraordinary adventure. Yes, you know? yeah, absolutely. And we have to, we have to think our way back into past terms of reference uh, um, with difficulty in some ways because uh, we live uh, in a modern society where uh, Probably the biggest change from antiquity is the amount of information uh, mm -hmm. that we have available and the speed that we can access that information, that we can mm -hmm. travel um, by jet and that we can also um, pick up a phone uh, or use the internet um, and uh, have all of these sources of information and sources of travel, of fast information and fast travel uh, that, uh, that they didn't uh, you know, have, have access to. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, they, uh, there were, of course, at the time in antiquity, you know, myriad cultures all over the world um, that were incredibly complex and sophisticated uh, from here in Australia to India to China to Africa um, there to North and South America. But not all of these cultures were in touch with one another. Um, so it, it is fairly distinctive in history 
um, that uh, first the Greeks, you know, became cognizant of a large area, and then the Romans, and then later on the Islamic empires, um, you know, extended the kind of reach of the amount of space mm. that uh, a person might travel and still be in, uh, you know, an area where they could speak, actually, mm -hmm. to the other people and where they could feel like they were partaking in a kind of common culture. Mm. Um, that's something uh, that, that really grows in, uh, in the ancient world mm. and then continues in the Middle Ages in the Mediterranean and especially east of the Mediterranean mm. in various ways. Um, so that's, and that's something that Corinth, um, the city that I uh, study and that I studied for my PhD, um, Corinth is a really important uh, city in that process of the growth of the Greek world and then of the uh, uh, establishment of Greek uh, culture um, over the course of the, the whole Hellenistic empire. So from, from Spain, basically, to, you know, northwest India. Mm -hmm. um, so Corinth was a, a major mercantile power. Um, they uh, uh, manufactured huge amounts of pottery and bronze uh, and other um, trade goods there. Uh, they did a lot of colonization in the western Mediterranean, mm -hmm. especially on the island of Sicily um, and, uh, and in southern Italy. Uh, but uh, then they followed up that colonization with uh, uh, a lot of maritime innovation, um, supposedly building the first warships in, uh, in Greece, uh, borrowing the design from the Phoenicians, particularly the, the people of the city of Tyre and Sidon mm -hmm. on the coast of Lebanon. Uh, and then uh, Corinth continued to be a major player um, as the capital city of Greece under the Roman Empire. So uh, in my book, Corinth in Late Antiquity, mm -hmm. uh, I just pick out about 500 years of the city's existence uh, and look specifically um, at the centuries from the 2nd to the 6th uh, after Christ uh, and Corinth's uh, emerging role not only as capital city for the administration of the region for the Roman Empire, but... Um, the growing um, power of the church and the role of the Bishop of Corinth, who's the archbishop in charge of all of Greece at that mm. time, um, and uh, comes to make the administration of the church be side by side and then actually dominant over the Roman, um, let's say, civic and uh, uh, provincial administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's amazing that it culmin all those events culminated like that. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I often sort of, uh, you know, uh, ponder how, you know, it all kind of started, like the genesis of all of this, mm -hmm. and correct me if I'm wrong, kind of, you know, started with the Greeks leaving their, their homes and venturing out into mm -hmm. the seas and, yes. you know, finding yeah. all these distant lands. And yeah. I guess if you track back a little bit, it kind of, um, it spawned just this, maybe, like, maybe I could say, you know, a revolution mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. a way, you know, um, at least for, mm -hmm. you know, in the Greek world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there was, there was certainly a revolution. There was a series of revolutions. Mm -hmm. um, it's not terribly distant to start with mm -hmm. the places that they go uh, because uh, Greece itself is uh, tiny compared to Queensland, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, I mean, you can drive from uh, the south of Greece, of the mainland, from the Peloponnese Peninsula, uh, all the way to Thessaloniki in Macedonia, the, the biggest city of the north, uh, you know, in a, in a, in easily in a day. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe six to eight hours. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would take you, you know, from here, uh, you know, not even probably, what, a quarter of the way up the mm -hmm. coast of Queensland, maybe a tenth of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're talking about, you know, small distances to start with, um, but uh, most of the travel is by sea, uh, and that's why my newest project uh, um, and my next book will actually be about seafaring religion of the ancient Greeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're going out to the east and to the west, and there's a lot of islands that they use as, as stepping stones. Mm -hmm. So they certainly settle the islands uh, already in the Bronze Age, uh, and then uh, come into uh, some sort of conflict with the Noans, the people of Crete, uh, and uh, um, incorporate them into uh, at least Greek 
language uh, sphere, perhaps some kind of actual um, imperial system as well, but Bronze Age people argue about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from Crete and from the Minoan island kind of landscape, uh, they certainly keep going east and west. Uh, and by the end of the Bronze Age, um, uh, the, uh, the Greeks are on Cyprus and along the coast of Asia Minor, uh, and uh, they're probably uh, uh, on all the islands of the Aegean and, and of Western um, Greece, too. And then in the Iron Age, the next era, um, they keep going farther. Uh, there's a press on to the Black Sea and to the Eastern Mediterranean, to Lebanon and to Egypt and to places like that. Mm -hmm. And in that part of the Mediterranean, they encounter, you know, very ancient but also very sophisticated and very well-defended civilizations. So uh, they uh, actually tend to serve as mercenaries, um, especially for the Egyptian pharaohs. Uh, and uh, um, and for the Assyrians uh, too, and as artisans, whereas to the West they don't find um, people living in as well defended cities, uh, mm -hmm. and so uh, many places in the coast of the Western Mediterranean, uh, especially the coast of Sicily and southern Italy, um, there they set up Greek cities um, that quite quickly uh, rise and flourish, so that by the uh, by the Archaic period, um, you know, by the sixth century BC, you have uh, uh, Greeks living in cities, not just in mainland Greece or the islands, but all around the coast of the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's mm -hmm. incredible. Um, mm -hmm. I actually read a book recently about um, the tales of Xenophon. Oh, yeah. And how fantastic. he was a yeah. mercenary. Yes, and, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Xenophon's uh, Anabasis and, or, mm -hmm. or March Up or March Back, depending on how you translate it. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic read. I think uh, even now, um, you know, people can, uh, can read it and enjoy it as a, uh, a story of adventure and a story of leadership, a uh, story of struggling against the odds, um, but also kind of a stranger in a strange land. Mm -hmm. um, but it also reminds you how close the Greeks uh, and the Persian Empire mm -hmm. were to one another um, in, the, in the fourth century BC. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great read, and uh, I teach um, Greek language, and in our advanced Greek class, uh, we read the historian Herodotus, and then mm -hmm. we read Xenophon as well mm -hmm. uh, every other year. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like... You know, most people know who Plato is, and yes. lots of people yeah. don't know who Xenophon yeah, is. Yeah, that's he true. He just had, you know, such a incredible life and he did, yeah. such an adventure. Yeah, and yeah. it kind of, I guess this is a good segue. I mm -hmm. guess it relates to what I really wanted to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. Just with Xenophon um, uh, as a case, I guess, as a mm -hmm. case study, mm -hmm. you know, he, he left his lance um, mm -hmm. to go. You know, he was a mercenary, but he mm -hmm. went on this adventure. Yeah. And I find that there's sort of this, um, this theme here in Greek society and culture, mm -hmm. um, even dating back to the... Um, the invasion of Troy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I was doing some research the other day, and I thought it was very interesting how, you know, um, when Homer wrote the Iliad, it was was it two hundred years after the invasion took place. Is well, uh, not not exactly. It was okay. probably a little longer. Uh, okay. We think um, it was somewhere between two hundred and four hundred years. Okay. Uh, now. Xenophon is a fantastic guy, mm -hmm. and I think he deserves to be much more well-known than he is today. Uh, and he was living in the late 5th and early 4th century. Uh, in fact, he lived into the middle of the 4th century. Um, but at his time, uh, you know, there, the world of the Eastern Mediterranean was already to a certain extent, uh, mapped and, and understood with reference to historical writings, and then also with reference to epic poetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so he would look to Homer um, as uh, a kind of famous bard, uh, much as we would look maybe back to Shakespeare um, mm -hmm. or even to, uh, uh, to Chaucer, um, you know, as someone uh, who had written uh, a whole lot of wonderful poems, uh, epics to be sung and uh, to be shared uh, as a, a kind of national 
um, and also uh, uh, really entertaining, but also edifying kind of mm -hmm. set of stories. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in Xenophon's day, uh, they thought of Homer as having lived uh, sometime in the 9th or 10th century. Uh, uh, however, today we think of him as actually living in the 8th century. So uh, modern scholarship has kind of downdated him a little mm -hmm. bit. But Xenophon thought he lived longer ago. And in fact, mm -hmm. we still have no hard evidence other than the poems themselves, mm -hmm. the epics mm -hmm. themselves, for who Homer was mm -hmm. or where he lived. There were all kinds of myths about mm -hmm. him. Um, some uh, scholars think that the Iliad and the Odyssey were written by different poets, and they only got attributed to a common poet Homer later on. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, certainly Homer, uh, or let's say the authors of the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, wrote those poems down for the first time in the 8th century BC when the Greek alphabet was adopted from the Phoenicians, from mm -hmm. the, the, um, uh, the Phoenician Lebanese alphabet. Mm -hmm. uh, now, how old the poems themselves were, though, uh, that's a big question, still an open mm -hmm. question. They were written down by someone who was in command of a mythological tradition, who had been singing those uh, poems uh, their whole life. Uh, but whoever that was, uh, that poet had been taught by previous poets, and those poets had been taught by previous poets. And we can tell from the language of the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, that they have a lot of words and a lot of formulas in them that go back uh, decades or even hundreds of years. Mm. Uh, so they are, parts of them are very old. Um, and parts of them could have been composed even at the time of the Trojan War. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, there's really good evidence from the Hittite sources uh, that there was conflict between Greeks and uh, the Trojans, uh, who were vassals of the Hittite king. Uh, my colleague here at UQ, um, Emeritus Professor Trevor Bryce, has written a whole series of books, actually, about the, the Hittite side of the story of the Trojan War, uh, wow. which uh, um, uh, is really worth checking out. Uh, so, as we have them, the epics of the Iliad and the Odyssey are not historical the way that Xenophon's writings are, um, but they're the result of centuries of um, performance, of epic traditional tales um, that were sung to a lyre uh, or a, a kithara, a kind of primitive guitar mm -hmm. um, that had uh, um, uh, seven strings and a much higher neck. Um, I'm not an expert in ancient music, but I've seen some reconstructions Mm -hmm. um, and heard some reconstructions. Uh, we always have to remember when talking about the Iliad and the Odyssey that, uh, that these are the lyrics for songs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that uh, they are thus, uh, you know, formulaic in some ways and they're dealing with tropes of heroism uh, and uh, they're amalgamating different eras of Greek history mm -hmm. um, from different places too. Mm -hmm. Um, wandering bards who, you know, sung the story and, and uh, um, tailored it right to their mm -hmm. audience. And mm -hmm. the versions that we have uh, are the, the version that was written down. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they are the kind of last generation of the oral epic tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am um, just so fascinating. This is mm -hmm. right up my alley. Um, oh, good. And I... I was watching a video about this, about myths and uh -huh. you know how important they are. Yeah. And um, this video really distilled um, myths in a in a great way. I thought mm -hmm. at the time, mm -hmm. it said that myths have um, staying sorry they have significance and they have staying power. Right, and that really stuck with me. Right. And I thought about the Iliad and um, the Odyssey, and mm -hmm. um, I know that there have been endless debates on when it took place. Yes. There's still yes, so definitely. much excavation being done. Yeah, and, yeah. and the excavation of Troy. Troy is the UNESCO World Heritage City, I mm -hmm. think, of the year this year. So uh, okay. I've actually just received um, uh, a, a bulletin about it mm -hmm. uh, and about the excavations there. So I'm a, a member of the Archaeological Institute of America, still the AIA, 
and uh, archaeological.org is a great website to find out more about um, archaeology in the ancient Mediterranean. Uh, and they, uh, um, they've had uh, uh, excavations at Troy now under um, uh, Brian Rose, mm-hmm. um, and then there are German excavations too. So both, both American That's and right. German teams digging at Troy and mm-hmm. improving upon um, the, uh, the fundamental, but by modern standards, mm-hmm. uh, even by contemporary standards, uh, really pretty amateur mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, efforts by Heinrich Schliemann mm-hmm. in the, the late 19th century. Um, but uh, but Schliemann did have the the benefit that uh, he uh, took seriously the idea that Troy was a real place, which of course the ancient people knew. Uh, Troy was an inhabited city; uh, it was a, a big city mm-hmm. all throughout antiquity. Um, but uh, but Schliemann he particularly took it seriously as a as a real place in the Bronze Age, mm-hmm. uh, and he had the goal when he uh, went and started digging there. Uh, with Frank Calvin, mm-hmm. who was a, a kind of British um, resident, uh, British man resident in uh, Northwest Asia Minor, uh, when they went there together to the, the mound of the ancient city, mm-hmm. uh, Hisarlik, and started digging, they were looking for that Bronze Age city, and they were looking for the Trojan War. Uh, and in fact, they found uh, nine different cities um, going back actually beyond the Bronze Age into the remote past mm-hmm. uh, uh, at cities which many of which had been sacked. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they found not one Troy uh, of the Trojan War, but but several. Wow. Mm-hmm. Ah, that's incredible. Yeah. That's so incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've been very fascinated in just the role of um, myth, mm-hmm, magic, mm-hmm, and religion, mm-hmm. if you will. And um, I was listening to a podcast about this um, a while ago um, by Dan Carlin, Mm -hmm. a great Mm -hmm. historical podcaster. Uh And it was very interesting. In the podcast, um, it really stuck with me. He said um, that when he was younger, he didn't really understand the role of mythology um, in the past. And obviously in all these stories Mm -hmm. like um, the Iliad and Mm -hmm. um, the Odyssey and the Aeneid, you know, there are elements of magic. Yes. And he didn't understand why they were relevant in a sense. And then he asked one of his history professors and... um, Basically, um, he gave this anecdote that, um, and his professor said that, you know, we need to study, you know, in order to understand the time period better and the people Mm -hmm. within these stories, Mm -hmm. um, we need to understand their worldview and what they actually believed in and what they valued. Right. And I think that directly relates to the Iliad and the Odyssey, for instance. And you can just see, you know, um, Mm -hmm. you know, like with the Aeneid, for instance, when Virgil wrote that, he was trying to sort of emulate mm-hmm. Homer, I guess, if Homer Absolutely. even existed. And Absolutely. I thought that was yeah. so fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Um, Virgil very, very um, uh, intently, deliberately, he set out to copy, adapt, um, uh, emulate, but also honor uh, the tradition of Greek mm. epic poetry and specifically the Odyssey and the Iliad, which had become uh, well before his day, the two uh, most famous and praised and loved uh, epic poems uh, mm-hmm. in not just in Greece, but all around the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he organized uh, his epic, the Aeneid, about Aeneas, into six books based upon the Odyssey, uh, where Aeneas would wander and then come to Rome, and then six books based upon the Iliad, uh, where Aeneas would fight uh, uh, with uh, Turnus uh, and uh, eventually triumph um, as the uh, the new uh, founder of uh, the city of Rome. Mm-hmm. Now, sadly, uh, Virgil died relatively young, uh, and he left it unfinished. Uh, in fact, right. uh, some sources say that uh, he uh, he wanted it destroyed actually, because it wasn't done. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, uh, thank goodness that uh, his wishes mm-hmm. were not observed um, because uh, it very quickly um, became uh, uh, loved and uh, read and performed and shared uh, in, uh, in Rome and then in all of the places where Latin uh, was spoken and, and mm-hmm. read. Uh, and it became a kind of formative Latin um, epic poem uh, 
even though he didn't come from the tradition of oral poetry that Homer did, mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he was coming from a very rich and wonderful Latin poetic tradition, and he was melding that with his Greek source material mm -hmm. uh, in a way that produced a, a poem of um, just unsurpassed uh, beauty and power in Latin, uh, which uh, uh, was, you know, something that uh, deeply moved me when I first read it in Latin class in uh, uh, in year eleven, uh, and uh, uh, something that I love returning to from mm -hmm. time to time um, over the years, and which I'm very excited to teach in English translation mm -hmm. in Myth, Magic, and Religion, uh, and CH twenty thirty, the class that I I teach in first semester. Wow, mm -hmm. that's amazing. I, yeah. I feel the same way, you know, mm -hmm. they just, they encapsulate the human condition in so many different ways, I guess. And that's right. I guess there's so many, you know, you see it in, it was performed, you know, in theatre and Dion, Dionysia. Mm -hmm. right? At the Dionysia. The yeah. Dionysia, that's yeah. right, that's yeah. right. And, yeah. you know, even to this day in movies, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm sure lots of people have seen the movie Troy. It's yes. not the most historically yes. accurate movie, no, but, but it's, it's lived on. It's a good and, story, and mm -hmm. uh, and I have to say, um, as classical movies go, mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, there's a lot to juggle, you mm -hmm. know, that modern filmmakers have to grapple with. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the movie Troy uh, gets a lot of things right. It has a fantastic cast. Uh, it's uh, um, it's got uh, it's got a lot of elements of the story there. Uh, I I'm disappointed that they uh, didn't actually follow the the Iliad mm -hmm. in making it um, because the Iliad is very specifically structured so as not to start with the abduction of Helen mm -hmm. or end with the fall of Troy. The Iliad is. Uh, is sung and is written uh, and has endured as a slice of the Trojan War. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it very specifically starts, Main and Idethea, rage, sing uh, about rage, muse, uh, and then uh, talks about what is the rage. It's the rage that Achilles had for Agamemnon and that Agamemnon had for Achilles. So it's actually about their anger of these two warrior aristocrat men of the Greeks. Mm -hmm. It's their anger at one another that actually sets the Iliad's plot mm -hmm. in motion. Uh, and the backdrop is the Trojan War. The backdrop mm -hmm. is Helen having been seduced by Paris, um, having been stolen away or gone willingly, depending on the version. Um, that uh, uh, that is all the backdrop to the mm -hmm. Iliad. Mm -hmm. The Iliad is about this confrontation between Agamemnon and Achilles, mm -hmm. between let's say um, the uh, leader, right, the king, the um, the uh, man who's acknowledged as the most powerful politically, that's Agamemnon, and Achilles, who is recognized as the best warrior, the mm -hmm. greatest actual fighter. Mm -hmm. So the man who displays the martial virtues of you know, an epic hero. Uh, when those two men come into conflict, that's uh, what uh, uh, Homer focuses on. Mm -hmm. That's what he took as his... his, uh, him, his uh, uh, story. Mm -hmm. And so I really wish that the movie Troy had actually paid attention to that and had had that be the central driving um, mm -hmm. conflict. And in some sense they did. I mean, the, the performances are great of Brad Pitt and I think it's Brendan Gleeson, maybe, mm -hmm. um, who plays Agamemnon, and in some ways their their battle of wills is is still a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but they uh, the, the screenwriter um, screenwriters muddied the waters a bit by uh, having Menelaus be killed by Paris <laughs> in the movie, mm -hmm. uh, since that doesn't happen in any of the mm -hmm. epic traditions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen in the Iliad, and it doesn't happen in any of the other versions of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to kind of throw that really dramatic death and dramatic confrontation mm -hmm. into 
uh, the story um, without any reason mm. for it and without it adding anything. Mm -hmm. uh, that that upset me a bit. Yeah. But I recognize that people who you know are not classical scholars probably that doesn't they don't get hung up as much about yeah. that. Um, but I could talk for hours about classical movies, yeah. um, you know, then and my you know top five or top uh -huh. ten um, and best and worst yeah. uh, as well. Um, Unfortunately, those ones with Sam Worthington really mm -hmm. have to be down at the bottom of the barrel, the Clash yeah. of the Titans, Titans yeah, yeah. and Wrath of the Titans. Those are both terrible, uh -huh. really terrible, yeah. uh, for so many different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, bad casting, bad setting, bad story. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't even get me started. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but Troy, I think, has a lot of valuable aspects to it. Mm -hmm. I'm still a fan of Gladiator, mm -hmm. I have to say. Um, and... Uh, uh, and I'm also, uh, for ancient world movies, um, uh, a fan of the Disney Hercules cartoon, mm -hmm. um, which has some wonderful music and, mm -hmm. and visuals. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a shame that um, there's a lot of fantastic stage plays, which in my opinion have not really been translated to the screen um, in a hugely successful way. But I've seen some fantastic uh, shows on Broadway in New York, also in Berkeley when I was a graduate student um, in, uh, 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 in the course of those, you know, two, being in those two theater areas. Uh, I've seen some wonderful versions of, uh, of ancient tragedy and of ancient comedy. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, especially Aristophanes' play uh, plays um, are really wonderfully done by the Greek theater companies mm -hmm. too, uh, which I've seen a few times in the U.S. and a few times in Greece. Uh, the Greek National Theater uh, and also the National Theater of Northern Greece. Um, uh, they both do wonderful productions mm -hmm. of, of stories from antiquity, but also specifically of actual ancient plays mm -hmm. of, uh, of ancient uh, comedies and tragedies mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and pull out a lot of new, new things um, from those. Uh, so that's, that's something I, I would love to see more of those productions end up as movies because uh, yeah, I think they, they'd be really good. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the only really good one of those that I know of um, is A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, uh, which got adapted first from a Greek play to a Latin play and then from a Latin play into an English Broadway mm -hmm. uh, musical and then got a movie made of it. And the end result is still funny and clever and true to the original um, mm -hmm. ancient play, actually. Yeah, I've got, there's so many different movies that, mm -hmm. you know, I could pick from, I guess. And I, I love all of them, you know, Troy, Gladiator. Mm -hmm. um, there was actually, um, recently there was a new show on Netflix um, called Troy. I think oh, it was right. Fall of a City I or heard of that. Like I think that. it was a British one, right? Yes, that's right. I didn't see it, actually. Did you see it? Yes, I saw uh -huh. it. It's, it's pretty good. Yeah? It's yeah. pretty good. Okay. But I guess, you know, in the Iliad itself, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think a standout for me, I mean, a real centerpiece of the story, as you said, you know, it starts in the middle of the Trojan War, yeah. is when Priam goes to see Achilles. Because, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, face value, I guess, you know, at the surface, it's, you know, um, people could easily say, oh, it's just a, you know, a story about war, you know. Mm -hmm. and in many aspects, it does glorify war. But at the same time, it, you know, it tells of the horror of war. Yeah. And I... You know, the movie wasn't perfect. I know they didn't kill Paris. I guess there are a lot of Orlando <laughs> Bloom fans out there. Yeah. But um, I love that scene in the movie, especially when Prim came to mm, yeah. Achilles' tent. And, yeah. you know, it's all about forgiveness. And there's, there's um, some deep truths in that story. And yeah. I find that really interesting, you know, the, um, like what these stories are trying to tell us. Um, I found it fascinating how, you know, in the Aeneid, you know, and Virgil was sort of inspired by... Um, I don't know if he yeah, even existed yeah. or not. But, yeah, um, yeah. Well, certainly uh, Virgil thought he existed. And, yes. Um, and someone wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, mm -hmm. so uh, we might as well call him Homer, mm -hmm. as that's what we've called him for, mm -hmm. for uh, you know, about uh, 2,700 years. Yeah. Um, it's just this whole, the process of myth-making is just so absolutely fascinating, you know, just to, to learn um, that, 
you know, uh, the main character Aeneas in the Aeneid um, was possibly based on Augustus, right? Well, certainly the the characterization, yes, uh, of him that Virgil gives to him uh, mm. in the Aeneid uh, draws upon Virgil's experience uh, as a, a court poet mm-hmm. um, in the Augustan circle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, he's pretty explicit about that in the, um, in the prophecy scene mm-hmm. that he sets in the Sibyl's cave in uh, Kumai. Um, he, uh, uh, he's pretty explicit there about uh, invoking um, the, uh, uh, the young Augustus, the, the young uh, man who would become Augustus, uh, uh, Octavian, um, mm-hmm. uh, who later took the name of uh, Gaius Julius Caesar mm-hmm. when his great uncle uh, supposedly left it to him, mm-hmm. uh, left him the name and also left him his, uh, um, you know, his property mm-hmm. uh, in his will. Um, that uh, uh, Virgil was a little bit younger than Augustus, um, but he certainly had first-hand experience, uh, as did you know all of the upper-class Romans uh, who were still around under Augustus's reign. Mm-hmm. They had experienced uh, the civil wars. Uh, they had experienced uh, really large-scale unrest uh, and conflict. <laughs> and they didn't want that happening again. Mm-hmm. And they were thinking through what it meant to be a Roman um, in, in that era um, where uh, Romans had been uh, ruling the Mediterranean by that point for, uh, for actually hundreds of years, but they had been ruling it as a republic, mm-hmm. um, as, a, uh, uh, as a city um, run by a democracy. Mm-hmm. And now, uh, over the course of the previous sort of hundred years, that uh, uh, democracy had been eroded by generals um, and uh, their conflicts for mm-hmm. power, uh, for military power against one another, and uh, that had come to the head um, with Augustus as the last man left mm-hmm. standing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it looked after several decades, uh, you know, as if uh, that, that's how things were going to be now for quite mm-hmm. a while, that uh, the Republic was going to be replaced by some kind of uh, empire um, mm-hmm. that uh, uh, was going to be ruled by one man, mm-hmm. uh, and that that man was going to come from the family mm-hmm. of Augustus. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Um, Virgil's working all of this into his portrait of Aeneas, um, both the actual young Augustus and um, his, and I think more broadly his uh, classes, um, kind of hopes and fears and dreams for what this new Roman imperium, Mm -hmm. this new Roman empire uh, would be like. Mm -hmm. Um, And... uh, uh, how it would be ruled and how it would be similar in some ways to uh, the great heroes of the mm-hmm. past, mm-hmm. The, the heroes like Aeneas, who had originally been claimed by the Greeks, mm-hmm. um, but had come to be claimed more and more over time mm-hmm. by the Romans uh, as, as their heroes, mm-hmm. too, as their, um, as their national heroes. Yeah. Um, so Aeneas certainly existed as a hero, as a Greek hero, uh, for hundreds of years. Oops, sorry. No problem. Um, uh, he certainly existed as a hero for hundreds mm-hmm. of years, but we know so little about uh, what his character, how his character was portrayed mm-hmm. in other works of literature mm-hmm. um, because Virgil's uh, uh, poem, uh, Virgil's account of him became uh, just so dominant. Mm. Uh, mm. that it kind of wiped away, uh, for the most part, mm-hmm. the other traces of him as, a, as an epic hero um, mm-hmm. in, in previous years. You can get a little bit of a, if it's something that's interested, you know, interesting to you, you can get a little bit of an idea of the pre-Virgil Aeneas mm-hmm. from, uh, for example, the Homeric Hymn to Aphrodite, uh, which was probably composed by a follower of Homer um, in the Archaic era. And that tells about uh, Aphrodite's affair with Anchises and uh, their, her conception mm-hmm. of Aeneas uh, as a demigod, right, a half man, half god, 
uh, and how that came about. Mm -hmm. um, you can find traces of it too in in the fragmentary epics, mm -hmm. uh, which unfortunately only survive as quotations. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that there were epics uh, about um, the uh, the Greek heroes uh, in, and the Trojan heroes, uh, including Aeneas, who survived the war and mm -hmm. their different returns. Now, the Odyssey is the only intact one of those epics that survives, mm -hmm. but we have quotations from others. So we know that there was one about Memnon, the Ethiopian, and his voyage back home, uh, about uh, the, um, the Greek and Trojan heroes who went to Cyprus uh, and settled there, uh, and probably some of these uh, these lost epics also mm -hmm. told us more about the the Greek version of the story of Aeneas. Mm -hmm. I find it really interesting mm -hmm. um, how these stories really tell us a lot about the Greeks and you know their mm -hmm. mindset, and mm -hmm. it almost sort of um, tells us a lot about who they were as people. Yeah. Um, you know, for instance, um, with you know the Aeneid, it's it's well, sorry, that was the. Um, the Romans, mm -hmm. but I there seems to be a parallel here with um, in the Aeneid. You know, it's what the Romans could be. You know, um, yeah. And I find it interesting how with the Greeks, on the other hand, you know, there's the story of the Trojan women, for instance, and there's the Melian dialogue. It's what we shouldn't mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. th these stories, they they seem to be, you know, very reflective of reality mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly the Melian dialogue is intended by Thucydides uh, here to here we go. <laughs> uh, deliberately to take what really happened and to dramatize it in the course of writing his history. Mm -hmm. So um, it's uh, <coughs> sorry, no problem. Probably one of the most dramatic parts of uh, all of Thucydides' history. Mm -hmm. Um, and he did that on purpose, for sure. Mm. Now, he tells us uh, that uh, it really did happen, of course, that the Athenian government threatened Milos. <coughs> and then when Milos would not surrender, they did actually take them over and kill every man mm. uh, in the island, uh, on the island, um, adult man, citizen, uh, mm -hmm. and enslave the women and children and resettle the island with Athenians. Mm -hmm. uh, it really happened. Uh, but uh, Thucydides, writing a few years later, he chose to structure his account of the war uh, and his account particularly of the seizure of Milos in the form of a dialogue, um, because that was the sort of thing that Socrates was doing and that Plato was doing, mm -hmm. uh, and that was a form of uh, literary um, expression that he could work into his history and that would dramatize what happened at Milos mm -hmm. uh, in a way to illustrate the moral, mm -hmm. which for him was very clearly uh, that the Athenians had gone wrong mm -hmm. at this point and their power had gone to their heads mm -hmm. uh, and particularly that the power um, that they could exert over small cities uh, and states uh, had um, overwhelmed the capacity of the democratic government to uh, to function in a uh, let's say morally ethically correct manner. Mm. Uh, but he doesn't say that. He dramatizes it. He illustrates it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in his history. Mm -hmm. That wraps up my first ever podcast episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Check out the show notes if you'd like to dive deeper and keep up to date with Dr. Amelia R. Brown's work. All the best.